Interior during the Reagan administration and served as New Mexico Secretary of Agriculture for 16 years. Honors received by him include the New Mexico Cattle Growers Cattlemen of the Year Award, the New Farm and Livestock Bureau's Distinguished Service of Agriculture, Progressive Farmer Magazine Southwest Man of the Year, and the New Mexico Cowbells Man of the Year. In December 2000 in Washington, D.C., Frank was presented the Dream Maker Award. This award was presented by the Going the Distance for MS Research Foundation for inspiring all of us to live full, productive, and happy lives no matter what our circumstances are. He is the author of the widely read blog, The Westerner, and is founder of the Du Bois Rodeo Scholarship at NMSU. I'd like you guys to welcome Mr. Du Bois. He's going to be talking about federal government in our background. Can everybody hear me all right? I apologize about my voice, but this disease has hit me in the vocal cords. It's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is I sat in my van with Joe Delk, and I spent an hour and 15 minutes telling him lies, and I shouldn't have done it. Anyway, the background on this is I've been thinking about how do you explain to the general public and people who don't deal with these issues every day, how do you explain to them the extensive federal control we have over our land, or they have over our land and lives in the West? And here a couple of weeks ago, Joe Delk brought two producers from the Glenn Beck TV program out here, and they came to my house and wanted kind of a backgrounder on these issues, and so I put this together. It's not finished yet, but anyway, I'm hoping this will explain to a lot of people. I should say that the Glenn Beck folks are doing a series of TV programs on federal agencies that bully individuals and people. And so I think, as I explained to them, I think this demonstrates why we are so vulnerable to federal bullying in the West. So anyway, this is called Federal Control of Western Resources, and I think even if you went to public school, you recognize that that's a map of the United States. And let's go to the next one. If we look at the land area, there's 3.7 million square miles, or 2.3 billion acres in the United States. Well, how is that land utilized? What's done with it? And the USDA does a kind of a soil and water survey every five years. And so if you look at that acreage, about 25% is in forest, 20% in grassland, pasture, and rangeland, 20% in crops, 13% in special uses, and 2.6% in urban land. The next one has the same figures, just as a pie chart, so you can see it that way. Let's go to the next one. If you're hearing that we need to protect lands and protect private property, and we need special government programs to do that, and so on, what those USDA figures show is only 5.2% of the United States is developed, as defined by 
USDA. So 95% is undeveloped. Okay. Let's look at the, the federal ownership of lands. The feds own 655 million acres, or almost 30% of the land in the United States, almost one out of every three acres. Well, how, you know, how big is that really? 655 million acres. How do you visualize that? Well, let's take the entire country of France. It's 158 million. The entire country of Spain is 123. Germany's 86 million acres. So you can put all three of those countries in the federal lands in the United States. In fact, this chart might be a, a hard for some of you to see, but you can put 10 European nations inside the federal lands in the United States. Okay. Where is this land located that these, the feds own? Well, yeah, no, not, I heard somebody say New York. Not, 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 not yet. Anyway, it's 90% uh, of that 655 million acres is uh, in the west and west of the Mississippi. And the average on those states is 50% ownership by the feds. If we next look at uh, the acreages by state, you can see uh, Nevada is tops at 84.5%, and New Mexico is at 41.8%. But you can see 84, 69, 57, 53, and so on. That's federal lands that are inside those states. Okay. Then let's look at the lowest. At the top is Connecticut, which is 0.4%. You go all the way down, if you go in the top 10, is Illinois with 1.8%. So in the West, we have situations like Nevada, where 85% of the state is owned by the federal government. In other words, if you're the governor of Nevada, you're sovereign over about 15% of the state. Uh, it's far different for the states uh, uh, east of the Mississippi. All right, well, if there's 655 million acres, who's, who's managing this? Who's uh, making the decisions on these lands? you got the Bureau of Land Management that's got uh, 253 million acres, plus uh, they manage 700 million acres of sur subservice. In other words, uh, oil and gas and, and mining. You have the Forest Service. They have 193 million acres on 155 national forests and 20 national grasslands. We've got the Fish and Wildlife Service, who has 150 million acres. They have 548 national wildlife refuges and 66 national fish hatcheries. Then you got the Park Service. They uh, manage 80 million acres and 394 separate units. Uh, of the National Park Service. Then you have the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And they have 55.6 million acres and 57 million acres of service that they manage, they hold in trust and manage for 565 different tribes. Here's one that people often uh, forget, and that's the Department of Defense. And the Department of Defense has 30 million acres. They got 545,000 facilities on over 5,400 sites. And 98% of this land 
of the 30 million is in the United States. Now, when, when you look at these lands, and you, those are the agencies and the acreages they control. But I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Endangered Species Act. And as part of that act, the Fish and Wildlife Service declares what they call critical habitat. And so that goes across uh, all different federal agencies and state and uh, private property. And the data I have is from a year ago, but there are 315 million acres set aside strictly uh, for critical habitat for threatened or endangered species. Wilderness. Now, this is the land use classification that uh, the environmental community really pushes. And this is what they, they, they really want. And uh, there's 100, uh, almost 110 million acres of wilderness right now in the United States. And I want to make sure you understand why the environmental community wants this. Uh, they call it the gold standard. But if you look at the Wilderness Act, it defines wilderness as a place in contrast where those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape. landscape. It's hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man and where man himself is a visitor who does not remain and a wilderness generally appears to have been affected primarily by the forces of nature with the imprint of man's work substantially unnoticeable and there shall be no commercial enterprise and no permanent road within any wilderness area. Okay. Uh, no use of motor vehicles, motorized equipments, no landing of aircraft, no other form of mechanical transport, and no structure or installation within any such area. In other words, I can't take this wheelchair into a, a wilderness area because it's considered mechanical transport. Well, in addition, I re remember uh, there, there were 110 million acres of this stuff. And if you go through that definition, you, you can it's easy to pick out. They're after man and man in his presence. And but in addition to wilderness that's been designated by Congress, in other words, it went through the legislative process, passed both houses of Congress and was signed into law by the President. In addition to that, you got the Forest Service, which has 60 million acres of what they, what they call roadless areas, that they're basically managing uh, to protect its wilderness characteristics. BLM's got 12 million acres of wilderness study areas. So, so you have a total of 181 million acres managed as wilderness. And to give you an example on how large that is, 14 of the states in the United States would fit in that 181 million acres. Okay. So, that's the story on land. Let's look at water. The, uh, wherever you have a federal reservation, along with that goes federally reserved water rights. And what the law and the court decisions say is, you know, how do they determine what a federal reserve water right is? How do they quantify it? 
It's in an amount sufficient to fulfill the purpose for which the land was withdrawn. So that means, uh, for instance, we have two million acres of Department of Defense land in New Mexico. That has reserved water rights attached to it of a sufficient amount to fulfill their, their primary purpose. Every Indian reservation has reserved water rights that we supposedly meet that definition. Every park, federal park, every federal wilderness area, every federal wildlife refuge, uh, and so on, they all have reserved water rights uh, for the purposes for which they were withdrawn. Now the important thing to know then is that those waters are not available to the state or to the public for development purposes. They're reserved to the feds. And I, I don't know how to go about quantifying this. Um, you, you have certain water rights, for instance, in New Mexico that have already been allocated uh, to the feds. But you have a whole bunch out there that are uh, laying in wait, so to speak, where the feds uh, may have applied and they haven't been awarded or where the, the, uh, uh, the feds are waiting until it gets to an adjudication process. So I can't tell you how much of New Mexico's water has been reserved by the federal government. In addition to all these reserved water rights, you also have uh, 12,602 miles of wild and scenic rivers. And if you look at that act, that only not only gives them control over the water, but the act also gives them control over the immediate environment. Well, I haven't gone down all those 12,602 miles to try to determine what the immediate environment was, but it's another example where they're controlling water and, in this case, some land and the use of that land. Well, that's land and that's water, and then there's our air. And the Clean Air Act uh, applies to all states uh, across the nation. But it's got a special provision there for parks and wilderness areas and national monuments that where you, wherever you have them designated, they then apply more stringent controls uh, under the Clean Air Act than you would have if you didn't have parks and wilderness areas. Uh, these are commonly referred to as a Hayes Rule, but it's in the federal law. And that means they have further control and uh, uh, over our resources in the West. And by the way, I didn't put it up there, but there's also special provisions in the Clean Federal Clean Water Act that allows them to do the same thing for waters uh, that pass through uh, wilderness areas or parks or national monuments. So it puts even more stringent uh, controls on, on the use of water. You know, the end result of all this is, is that we're, we're chained down by the feds here. The, the federal presence is immense. And it's because of that immense federal presence uh, that the state of New Mexico and individuals in New Mexico are so subject to bullying or to being pushed around <coughs> by the federal government. That's uh, the end of my presentation, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that anybody has. I have a question about the members of Congress from the Western states. Do they try to post some of this enactment by, I guess, what is it, environmental people that have control over all this? Some do, 
do and some don't. Um, if, if you look at the population and so on, uh, the, every western state has two senators, just like the eastern states. The House of Reps is, is based on population. But unfortunately, within uh, the House of Representatives and in the Senate, even amongst uh, the senators and congressmen from the West, you have those who are pushing the environmental agenda, who believe the only way you can protect something uh, is by a federal law. And, uh, you know, I could, I could throw out two examples, you know, just pull them out of the blue. How about Tom Udall and Martin Heinrich? Two senators from the West. And uh, Udall especially is totally bought into the environmental agenda. And if you look at uh, our reps, two out of the three vote right down the line with uh, the environmental community. And so Steve Pierce is, is, as far as these are my personal opinions, he, he's the only one that's close uh, to understanding these issues and really trying to do something about it. Yes, sir. Mexico, we have a lot of oil wells in the state, and the federal government taxes the oil wells something up. And uh, I wonder if they get they make probably five hundred billion dollars a year per month, per month. Uh, and finally, if you have our own state, we can get it. Well, that brings up an interesting question, doesn't it? The uh, yeah, if, uh, uh, if you're a private company, you have to bid on a lease and then and put that money up front before you ever even drill or, or anything else. Then you have to get a, a permit to drill and you have to go through all the environmental stuff. And uh, But a, a huge amount of, uh, of revenue is generated by those oil and gas. And a lot of it goes to uh, the state, not to the feds. But yeah, if 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 uh, you would double or triple the income to the state of New Mexico, if the state was administering, if those lands had been transferred to the state, uh, you would absolutely. The the Range Improvement Task Force at New Mexico State, uh, there. They did an analysis of the, the transfer of federal lands to the states. Uh, this was done back in the 70s. But they found that the, the state of New Mexico, you know, forget the freedom and the liberty and, and all of the, uh, the Constitution and everything else. You just looked at it from a strictly economic standpoint that the state of New Mexico would be way ahead if those lands were transferred to the state. And there, there's a movement going on now that uh, uh, was started in Utah, and Utah has passed a, a uh, Transfer of Public Lands Act, and what they're proposing is saying, look, we'll, we'll take all these Defense Department reservations and all the Native American reservations and all the wildlife refuges and, and uh, all the parks and all, uh, all the wilderness areas and, and we'll leave those in federal hands. But the multiple use areas uh, primarily managed by the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management will transfer those to the state. Uh, that's kind of picked up across the West I think there's four, maybe five western states now that where the legislatures have established study committees to look at this to see would this be good for the state and how, how could it be done. Uh, Representative Yvette Harrell from uh, Alma Gordo has introduced similar legislation in New Mexico. Uh, but 
for some weird reason, our state legislature hasn't uh, seen fit to pass. They don't even want us to study it. That's, that's all her legislation does is say, let's take a look at this and let's see whether this would be good for New Mexico or not. And the legislature says, no, we won't even look at it.
is a minority who uh, represent my views anyway. In the figures you gave us from the land, the federal government, would that include the state controlled land? No, that was strictly federal. Strictly federal? Yeah, if you yeah, I believe it's about nine million acres. So that we added to the figure we gave us, right? Yeah, I w my presentation today was about the federal presence in the state uh, or in the western states, and so I didn't. If you're looking about how much private property is out there, uh, I think it's right around thirty percent. So either the federal government, state government, county government, and the municipal government, uh, there's only 30% left that's privately owned. Uh, you know, there's a huge imbalance on the map that you showed between federally owned lands in the west and federally owned lands in the east. Has it always been that way? Were they, were they, has the federal lands in the east always been fairly minuscule comparatively, or, or has there been a transfer back to uh, private land? Well, to make a, a long story short, uh, in the east, the answer is yes. Um, I thought it was simply a deal where the Homestead Acts that worked in the East didn't work out West, and, and so we got stuck with this situation. But when I got to researching it, I found out this, this happened during uh, the Articles of Confederation, that uh, you had six landed uh, states then, and when, when they were trying to establish the Articles uh, of Confederation, the so-called landless states said, hey, you know, you're putting us in with these huge states, and, and if the house is going to be based on population, they're, they're going to they're gonna run the show, and we, that's an unfair advantage. So to, to farm uh, the Confederation, those landed states ceded their what were called Western lands uh, to the Confederation. And that's, that's how they got it passed. So this is an instance where right from the beginning, the federal government had, uh, I believe it was, it was 233 million acres that those six states transferred to the Confederation. And remember, those different states were uh, established by land grants. And, and some of those land grants, if you read the grant language, it says from sea to sea. But, you know, Britain, uh, that got shut off at the Mississippi River originally because of, uh, I, I believe it was Britain uh, losing the war to Spain, and so they, Spain took that over and so on. But no, uh, uh, at one time, for instance, uh, uh, both Ohio and Kentucky were 90% owned by the federal government. And today they're like 2% and 3% owned by the federal government. So what that means is, is that the feds lived up to their part of the deal. National policy up until 1976 was to dispose of these lands. And they could dispose of them by uh, sale, or they could dispose of them by exchange. And so, so there were grants, uh, land grants to the railroads too. But anyway, the, uh, what has happened is, when national policy was to dispose of these lands, they disposed of them. But in 1976, they passed FLIPMA, the Federal Land Management Policy Act, 
And that changed national policy from disposal to retention. But, but things that happened before that, uh, a lot of my friends in the livestock community will, uh, are very proud of, for instance, uh, the 1934 uh, Taylor Grazing Act and uh, how some key New Mexicans played roles in getting that act passed. And they established all these uh, grazing districts. Well, what they, and they did that. And it brought some order to grazing on public lands. But the other thing it did is those lands were set aside for their primary use was for grazing and they were within a grazing district, so they weren't disposing of them. So the feds weren't really disposing of land uh, very much, uh, you know, from the early 1900s on. But the official policy changed in, in 1976. And if, if, if you look at the uh, New Mexico Constitution, you know, each state, they, they have to pass a state enabling act, the Congress does, for you to become a state. And, and as part of that, they have to uh, review and approve your state constitution. But if you look at the New Mexico Constitution, it says right there that New Mexico gives up all right to the unreserved public lands within the state of New Mexico. But our enabling act also says that those lands will be disposed of and the, uh, by the feds and New Mexico will get 5% of the proceeds of any federal disposal of those lands. So it, it's clear that uh, everyone uh, including the founding fathers of the state of New Mexico thought that those lands would be disposed of and they never dreamed that uh, what was it, 70 some odd years later national policy would change and, and they haven't been disposed of. And, and that's what this whole uh, Utah Transfer of Public Lands Act is about. It's taking those uh, most used lands and transferring them back to the state that there is an, uh, maybe not a contract but certainly an obligation by the Congress to follow through on what they said when we became the state and when other western states came in. Are there any more questions? Well, thank you. I, if anybody has any ideas about how I can make this better, uh, let me know. And thank you for inviting me this evening. And I would like to thank Sharon for inviting uh, Frank to us. Um, we all know how important it is to vote. Um, the governor appoints the state engineer, so we want to make sure we keep her in there for another four years. Um, I think, too, we have a responsibility down here to carry our message up north. They, they think that they're their own little world and that it will never happen to them, and it will. So any chance that you guys have to talk to somebody in the Albuquerque or north area, please do. Again, thank you, Frank. Thank you so much for everything you do, and when Glenn Beck makes you uh, famous, <laughs> remember us. Um, at this time, I just want to take a few minutes um, for candidates to give us an update on how your campaign is going, how you feel. Uh, Pam, will you start us?
five points down uh, from, a, from a poll that was done about a month ago. That poll also said that Allen had low name recognition. So with low name recognition, we're still within five points. It should be 20 points. People are not happy with what's going on. And they're looking for some, for some new faces to go to Washington. I hope Mr. Way reminds the constituents that you don't pin the letter to target conservatives. And um, you should fit that into the conversation every time you can. Um, uh, what, what are you talking about? I'm sorry. You don't pin the letter to target the conservative oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, the RS deal. Yeah. Right. You don't also signed a letter, uh, not voted, to uh, approve the UN uh, small arms treaty, which would have required gun registration. He's done. We've got a list. Okay. We're going to remind people of uh, some of the things that he's done. And, and I'd what, like. What, what I'm going to leave with Kathy is some new palm cards. We call these palm cards. One of them addresses uh, Alan as a businessman, and the other addresses Alan as a veteran. And for those who don't know, Alan served uh, two tours in Vietnam, and he got three Purple Hearts out of that. Um, so he's a veteran, and you know about all the veteran, uh, Veterans Administration problems that are going on. So, And then he's just a successful businessman. So he makes payroll, he signs paychecks, that kind of thing. He, he complies with all the government crap that he has to put up with. So he, he knows it from both as a veteran and as a businessman. So we appreciate the help you give. We'd um, love for you to extend another invitation for him to get down here and introduce himself. So uh, I've right got now, right now he's scheduled for three events in this area in Sierra County. Uh, he plans to be at the uh, Peterson Ranch event. Okay. On Saturday, by uh, that Saturday afternoon. Uh, and then right now the. Uh, Day's parade is on its schedule. Okay, good. And uh, there's going to be another event later in October that he's probably going to be coming to also. Okay, super. Thank you so much. Again, um, I'd like to thank all our servicemen, retired or active, for everything they've done. Also, the Pearson Memorial is to honor uh, one of our own who survived two tours, three tours, defending our. Right. And uh, God decided he would take him from the earth here, not in combat. But um, God bless Adam and your family. And everyone should attend that rodeo. Yes, Sharon. Speaking of that, we're going to have a Republican Party rally for the candidate up at the Peterson Rodeo on Saturday afternoon. I think Alan Lee is going to speak and the Bill's Congressman appears. We're still trying to get the donor. She won't come to the rodeo. She's coming in. Agreed. Thank you so much. Um, if there's nothing else, I'll first of all thank everyone for attending um, on behalf of our great speaker. It's great information, and please contact us, Mr. Du Bois, if there's anything we can do for you. And we appreciate the, the battle that you're fighting. Uh, so, yes. I have one quick announcement. Before we meet again on August 13th, it's a Wednesday, speaking of federal encroachment, the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife will be holding a public hearing on the expansion of the wolf boundaries, which is usually held in Marriott and Albuquerque. They're actually holding a hearing to their consequences. I have no doubt they will implement this plan, regardless of what we say, but they should at least have to look at the eye, eat in our hotel, sleep in our restaurants for that one night. So please show up August 13th, Civic Center.
and the New Mexico Cowbell, Cowbell's Man of the Year. In December 2000 in Washington, D.C., Frank was presented the Dreammaker Award. This award was presented by the Going the Distance.